Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest Sporties webinar. We're really happy you could join us tonight for what promises to be a pretty uh, interesting topic. The topic tonight is weather flying and the iPad. Uh, we're going to be talking about this mostly from an in-flight perspective. Uh, certainly, the iPad has changed the way a lot of pilots fly, uh, but I think one of the underestimated ways in which it has done so is what you can do uh, in the cockpit with it. It's not just something uh, you know you can do before flight, but something you can do in the cockpit with a variety of tools. So we'll be talking about those tonight. My name is John Zimmerman with Sporty's Pilot Shop. I'm pleased to be your uh, host tonight. and. Uh, for those who haven't been on a webinar before, uh, I do work at Sporty's Pilot Shop there and uh, do a lot of the new products development and some marketing there. But I come to you more tonight as a, an active pilot who flies with the iPad and weather products in the cockpit. Um, I fly a variety of aircraft from tail draggers to helicopters to turboprops and have gotten a chance to fly over the last six years with the iPad in a lot of different situations. And I uh, want to share just some of those perspectives with you tonight. I certainly couldn't do it alone, so I'm pleased to be joined tonight by a real pro when it comes to weather, and that's Scott Denstadt. Uh, Scott, also an active pilot and a flight instructor, but also a real weather guru. Uh, Scott is a former meteorologist with the National Weather Service who knows weather from a very, very technical perspective, but also brings his interesting and unique uh, approach as a member of the team at ForeFlight, who has really worked on a number of the weather products that you see. Uh, in that app. So Scott will be uh, st starting us off this evening with a little bit uh, and then I'll be uh, finishing up. We're happy to have Scott with us. I'll give you a quick uh, overview of what we're going to cover tonight in this presentation. We're going to start out with a look at Sirius XM weather and sort of what that means and how you can get that on for flight uh, and a couple of tips regarding that. Uh, and then we'll share some tips on the other weather option in flight which is ADSB weather and Stratus. Then we'll go over a couple of tips for using those products in flight and how to get the most out of them and how to get the right answers from them. And then we'll close with some real world scenarios to try to tie it together, hopefully that will um, you know, make sense out of some of the, the technical stuff that we're gonna cover. Um, before we get any further though, I do wanna remind you a couple of housekeeping notes. First, this webinar will be recorded. So uh, if you have to step away for a moment or if you miss something, uh, don't worry, we will have a recording up in the next couple of days. You can see that at sporties.com slash webinars. Also want to invite you to ask questions throughout the night. On the right side of your screen in the go to webinar control panel, you'll see an area there where you can type in questions. Feel free to type those um, as they come into your, into your mind and we'll save some time at the end and Scott and I would be happy to answer some of those questions. Now before we turn it over here to Scott, I want to uh, start out with a quick poll and get a get a handle on what you're flying with right now when it comes to weather. So if you check on the screen there, what type of in-flight weather device are you flying with right now? Are you flying with ADS-B weather, like a Stratus? Are you flying with an XM or Sirius XM weather box, whether it's portable or in the panel? Uh, are you using both? Maybe you've got XM weather in the panel and ADS-B for your iPad. Or are you using neither one of them and you're using the good old Mark I eyeball? Take just a second there and check off of that, and then we will uh, share the results here. All right, most of the votes in here, and it looks like the majority um, actually flying with none, uh, almost 50% flying with none. Very close behind that would be ADSB weather. 10% uh, of you flying with both, and uh, about 4% flying with XM or Sirius XM. Excellent, thanks for voting in that poll. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott, and uh, he's gonna dive into that SiriusXM option and uh, tell us a little bit about what that what that means, what it can do for you, and maybe some of the new things that you may not have seen. So give us one second here while we flip things over to Scott. All right, John, I appreciate it. Um, thanks for uh, letting me uh, share in this webinar again. Yeah, as uh, John mentioned, I am the uh, weather scientist. They keep me pretty bu busy over there at ForeFlight. Lots of new features we're working on over the next uh, couple of years, but I want to talk one about uh, a new feature in ForeFlight. That is with uh, Sirius XM weather. Oops. Well, there are basically two different XM weather providers and one pipe. Essentially, XM satellite radio is the pipe 
that's used to, to uplink and broadcast the weather that you see in the cockpit. The two that are available are through Barron's. If you're a ForeFlight user, you may have seen uh, the XM mobile link through, um, through ForeFlight. Then there's WSI who provides the data for Sirius XM. We're going to focus on the latter. So what is Sirius XM? Well, it's, it requires a satellite receiver called the SXAR1, that you see pictured here on the right. And that particular uh, unit um, comes with uh, optional antennas. Essentially, you can have a GPS antenna and also the XM antenna and have an uh, optional antenna to basically hide that box. And then the antennas can be, uh, can be put anywhere, essentially, where you have good visibility to the sky. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. You can buy the unit uh, for $300 with the rebate uh, through Sporty's Pilot Shop. A great deal uh, for a really good product overall. But unlike ADSB, it does require a monthly subscription of uh, about $40. But we have a unique kind of pricing tier in Syria for Sirius XM and ForeFlight. And I'll talk about more about that in just a bit. Unfortunately, it does require that you have a U.S. address. We're working with the uh, Sirius XM for Canada uh, to get it in there, but right now, in order to sign up for that, you have to actually have a U.S. address. So it connects to the iPad or iPhone via Bluetooth, which is really an important aspect of this. It also has a built-in GPS. So we know if you have um, a, uh, the ADSB receiver, like for instance the Stratus, you can connect that via Wi-Fi, but you can also essentially receive the traffic that comes from the, uh, the ADSB in addition to being able to connect uh, via Bluetooth to the Sirius XM uh, uh, box. So you sort of get the best of both worlds. But any, any satellite weather product needs visibility to the sky. Uh, whereas ADSB basically needs visibility to the ground. That's where the ground transmitters are, uh, are located uh, for ADSB. So you need it to the sky for Sirius XM or any XM or satellite-based product and need visibility to the ground for ADSB. So placing the unit uh, in your cockpit is kind of important. Uh, depending on your type of cockpit, uh, you'll want to find the kind of the best place uh, where it has a, essentially a southern exposure for Sirius XM. It's generally preferred because that's where the satellites uh, are located. But the nice thing I think about, uh, I really like about the XM product, Sirius XM, is that within about 15 minutes you can get a complete weather picture before you even depart, before you essentially get to the end of the runway and depart. You can get basically all the products that you need, all the weather data that you need. Whereas in the ADSB world, if you don't have a tower that's actually on the field, you actually have to get up in the air, maybe a thousand feet or so, before you start picking up uh, any kind of uh, weather data. Uh, Sirius XM allows you to essentially pick all that up, including a nas nationwide um, a radar uh, depiction. So really, really good from that standpoint, especially if there's an interesting weather around where you're departing. You really want to have that, that picture before you depart. Now, in ForeFlight 8.1, we released uh, the Sirius XM support uh, within the app itself. And the ForeFlight tier currently consists of your basic products like METARs and TAS, pilot reports, AirMets, SIGMets, and Convective SIGMets. Winds and temperatures aloft, the lowest tilt radar, and the composite radar, we'll talk about those two in just a bit, as well as storm attributes, lightning, and the almighty TFRs. So the, the products that you see now are just the beginning. This fourth flight tier will continue to add more products with f future releases of the app over the next year or so. And we're not necessarily going to be raising that $39.99 price. So this particular uh, uh, package deal uh, will only get better, essentially. I can't really say at this point in time what those other products will be. I can only say just stay tuned, but I think you'll find that the way we've designed the ForeFlight tier, we basically pulled in all the products that would be really, really useful to the pilot in the air and put those together, and we're going to continue to improve that uh, with uh, uh, future releases of the app. 
Now it's real important anytime you're flying with any kind of weather to know exactly what the source is. So every product that's available through the SXAR1 should have a Sirius XM label that indicates the source. So usually it's next to the age of the, of the product. In this particular case, it's showing a, a METAR, I'm sorry, a TAF that's 30 minutes, 38 minutes uh, old. And you'll see the label Sirius XM. Now if it was coming from ADSB, you would see the ADSB label there as well. And if there's no label, it's most likely coming uh, through the internet. Let's talk a little bit about Sirius XM Lightning, one of my favorite products, because it's not available uh, through ADSB. It includes both cloud to ground and intra cloud lightning. That's real important uh, for a number of reasons. Um, we find that most thunderstorms, when they initially develop, have a lot of uh, intra cloud lightning. Also, very um, a lot of severe storms are essentially dominated by intra cloud lightning. So it's real important to be able to have both of those together to paint the, the right picture. So we know that lightning is a, is a great indicator of severe or extreme convective turbulence in that particular region. And you don't get that with ADSB at this point. But not every strike is, is broadcast. Instead, it uses a about a half a nautical mile grid spacing. If you see the image on the right there, you can see how the, the lightning uh, strikes are spaced in a gridded form. But nevertheless, it's still pretty dense and coarse, especially when you zoom out, so you can get a really good indication of where the truly nasty weather is located. And the coverage of lightning is really, really excellent overall. It includes lightning in locations where radar doesn't exist. So if you happen to venture off the, uh, in, into, let's say, the uh, Canada, coastal U.S. waters, the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, Central America, and even the northernmost part of South America. Now, it is true that you won't necessarily, you won't see, uh, you won't be able to get uh, XM, Sirius XM reception in some of those areas, but nevertheless, uh, if you're flying towards, let's say, Puerto Rico, uh, you can certainly see what's happening in, in terms of the, the lightning in that particular area. Now there are basically two radar mosaics that we, we provide with the Sirius XM product. One of them is the composite. That basically covers the lower uh, 48 U.S. states and immediate coastal waters around the U.S. There's also the lowest tilt, the lowest el elevation angle of the radar. And that's also the lower uh, 48 U.S. states, but it also includes the Canadian Doppler uh, radar as well, so you get to see what's happening in Canada. And it includes Puerto Rico and islands further southeast down to Barbados. So it would be the U.S. Virgin Islands and the British Virgin Islands and such. So you get, a, again, a, a weather picture of what's happening down there. Once again, if you were traveling down there, eventually you'll lose the XM uh, satellite reception. But it gives you at least a, a, a depiction of what's happening in the area if you happen to be heading down that way. Also, there's storm attribute markers, which I find to be uh, very useful. And at the end, I'm going to show you an example why they are very useful. They're similar to the markers uh, that you would see in ForeFlight when connected via Wi-Fi. So you have the basic storm marker, hail, mesocyclone, and what's called a tornadic vortex signature when the radar is picking up a circulation that represents the possibility of a Doppler-indicated tornado. And it also includes the echo top heights in uh, hundreds of feet. So if you see something that says 300, that would be 30,000 feet for the echo top. That's basically the highest uh, top in that particular area, that cell, uh, registering 18 dBZ or higher. There's also storm tracks that basically track various different cells radars picking up. Now these come from the National Weather Service radars themselves. So you'll see an arrow uh, that's presented here in ForeFlight that points in the general direction of movement of that particular cell. So the longer the arrow, the faster the, the cell is essentially. And when the speed is greater than 10 knots, you'll see uh, circles or dots that are added to that arrow. You see the one here that's extending from the 50,000 or 500 uh, storm marker. You'll see uh, two dots where the first dot represents um, the location of the cell based on its current movement, it would be speed and direction at 20 minutes, and then the second dot is at 40 minutes, and at the end of the arrowhead is where it would be essentially in 60 minutes. Now this, this uh, data gets updated and refreshed uh, every five minutes, so 
Obviously that will change as time goes by, but at least gives you some impression as to where the weather is moving. But there are limitations here. It's not unusual to see arrows of adjacent cells pointing in opposite directions. You can see right here uh, on the right that you've got a mishmash of cells pointing in all different directions from to the southeast, to the northwest, uh, directly to the west, so all over the place. And that can, that can happen uh, quite a bit. And usually what happens here, what we see is that sometimes, like the two uh, four, 450s that you see, they kind of overlay over each other. They come from two different adjacent um, Doppler weather radars. And essentially, in this case, they're, they're kind of lining up. But you see the other, uh, the other markers in the, where they're pointing don't seem to line up. Sometimes that's because the, the radars themselves can interpret areas of development as movement, especially when you get convective, uh, convection starting to, to really blossom up. So in initially, when convection is just starting, where you have a lot of kind of random cells here and there, you know, the air mass thunderstorm kind of situation, where they're not moving a whole lot, you may see some weird, really weird markers pointing in opposite directions. But once the once the actual weather system develops and becomes mature, most of those markers point in the general same direction. So I always recommend that you always turn on the winds aloft as well, and 18,000 feet is a good number to pick. 18,000 feet generally is what we call the belly button or the waistline of the atmosphere. And that's a good marker as to saying what direction the winds are, uh, are going. Typically represents kind of where the cells are heading. Uh, so always have that uh, winds aloft up there to check out and make sure that that is aligned up uh, pretty much with it. And that will give you a, a general indication. And when the winds are kind of light and variable, you may find that these, uh, these um, particular arrows may point in many different directions. Now one of the questions since we released date one that I get a fair amount is the, the radar resolution in the XM. A lot of pilots are not very happy with the, the Sirius XM uh, radar resolution, but it happens to be the same resolution as you get with ADSB. So here I was out flying on a particular day at ADSB connected, and that's on the left. And you can see the traffic is is uh, is being presented there on the left side as well. And you compare that to the Sirius XM on the right, and those little uh, squares or pixels for the radar are exactly the same size, independent of which two of the uh, the products you use. In fact, you can see on the right we have. Uh, traffic uh, presented as well because I have my Stratus connected via Wi-Fi and my uh, Sirius XM connected via Bluetooth. So essentially uh, the two products are exactly same. The left would be the regional radar from the um, from ADSB, not the na national radar which has really got a poor, very poor resolution, but the regional radar and then the Sirius XM is on the right. So exactly the same in terms of that. Although I find that the Sirius XM product is just a few minutes uh, uh, more fresh when it refreshes than what you get with uh, ADS-B. Now the other aspect of why the resolution, why some pilots are unhappy, is that Sirius XM uses actually the lower resolution long range radar from Nexrad, whereas the Barron's product uses the higher resolution short range radar. And there's a number of reasons why one is essentially better than the other. As you can see, here's Hurricane Matthew off the coast of Florida, and certainly the longer range radar reaches further out, as whereas you'll see on the right side, Barron's tends to cut off that, uh, that, so if you're flying a lot, especially into, let's say, into some of the, uh, the islands off the coast of Florida, the longer range radar is going to be something that's really important. Or if you fly off the Gulf Coast, for instance, Again, uh, the longer range radar is going to, be, uh, going to be better for you. Plus also in mountainous regions where some of the, um, uh, there's not as much overlap of radars, having the long range radar uh, is actually going to fill the gaps in, in those particular areas much better. But nevertheless, in either case, whether you're looking at Sirius XM or Barron's, in, in most situations, uh, both are going to have a, a really nice depiction of what's going on and help you really truly uh, get away from any kind of serious weather and, and, and know where it exists. So either case, uh, you're going to get a quality product. Now I want to talk a little bit about one of the problematic aspects of satellite weather. Um, when I was putting together a presentation, I was panning through using ForeFlight. I had to connect it, uh, Sirius XM connect it. And I, immediately something uh, took my eye here and I I looked at it and I see what essentially are a bunch of lightning strikes and one of those storm markers for hail. 
but not a single, uh, not, not a single indication of any radar underneath of that. I looked up, and I sure enough, I, I had picked, make sure I had the radar selected, but uh, but nothing was there. And so I panned down just again to, to see what's what's happening here, and you can see that in this particular case. Um, you still have the lightning strikes with the, that uh, hail storm marker, and what you see on the right, there's lots of radar returns out there. So what was going on? In this particular case, this particular region in Texas um, was not getting any precipitation, and certainly they were expecting some precipitation to develop in that particular region, but they had uh, essentially implemented what's called a gross filter over that region. That's just the way of filtering out a lot of non-precipitation returns, essentially ground clutter, anomalous propagation, and a few other things. They cause non-precipitation returns to sort of leak through, and they put these filters on to, to eliminate all that. It's kind of the easiest thing to do. But if that filter isn't removed uh, when actual radar is developed, it does a great job filtering out real precipitation as well, as you can see here. So I watched this go through for some time, and finally, at some point, uh, here's a, another kind of uh, picture of what it looked like. Um, uh, if you zoomed in on it, see lots and lots of lightning, but no radar uh, depicted there. So at some point in time, it popped right in, and we got the radar depiction. So what I always tell folks is that if you're flying with um, this particular product, always have your, your storm uh, cell markers turned on and your lightning turned on, because they won't be filtered through this process. So it's a great way to pick up when those kind of uh, issues happen. Nothing we can do essentially about it, just something that happens as part of the normal process of preparing and developing this particular product. So anyway, that's one example of uh, kind of how to, to, to use these all these products together. And that's all I have today, John. Um, we can flip it back to you. Thanks, Scott, very much. And we'll uh, make the exchange here and talk about ADSB. A uh, reminder as we do this, everyone, to uh, please feel free to add your questions, and uh, we'll get to those at the end. So uh, with that overview from Scott on on uh, sort of how the Sirius XM side of things works, let's walk through the other popular option uh, in flight, which is ADS-B, and then we'll show some of the stuff in the real world what it, uh, what it looks like. So with ADS-B on um, for flight, uh, we're talking about... Uh, Typically, Stratus is the ADSB receiver. Uh, Garmin's GDL39 series also works. Uh, the most popular option so far has been Stratus. Uh, this is the latest model, the Stratus 2S. Um, it does receive that subscription free ADSB weather. It also has a couple other things in there, as Scott alluded to. It has the uh, WASP GPS, so it'll give you your moving map position. It receives the ADSB traffic, um, which Again, gets complicated with how much traffic you see, but uh, if you have ADSB out in your airplane, you'll have a really great traffic picture. That is for sure. Uh, it also has a built-in AHARS or an attitude heading reference system that provides a backup attitude uh, display in the iPad. Uh, it has a built-in eight-hour battery, so it's got very long battery life, and because of that, there's no wires or antennas. It's just uh, the single box, and it's eight ninety-nine, so uh, more expensive than the Sirius XM receiver. But again, with ADSB, there is no subscription fee. Um, you, you can think of it as your tax dollars having paid for it. So just as a real quick reminder, this is, uh, this is the Sirius XM coverage area, which is pretty simple. It's, it's most of North America. Uh, there's you know, large geostationary satellites up there beaming down. So you've got really everywhere in the US, including on the ground, uh, much of southern Canada and parts of the Caribbean. ADSB is different. It doesn't come from a satellite. It comes from ground stations. And so it says you want to think of these like VORs where uh, altitude equals better reception and line of sight is what matters. Uh, so this is an estimate of ADSB reception at 1500 feet AGL from the FAA. You can see actually in the eastern part of the U.S. coverage is pretty darn good. Uh, we're talking about basically pattern altitude here. But as you get out west, uh, there are fewer stations over the plains and the, certainly the mountains of the Rockies make things a little trickier for reception. So that's an area where, you know, if you're based in, uh, say, central Nevada, you get a lot better, uh, you get a lot sooner weather picture from Sirius XM than ADSB. What I will say though is this next map is probably more typical. This is 5,000 feet. So this is a typical cruise altitude for most piston airplanes and certainly even higher for uh, turbine airplanes. 
And you can see there that basically the entire U.S. is covered. And uh, in my experience, flying anywhere outside of uh, the Rockies, really, you're going to have four, five, six ADSB ground stations at any one time. So it's certainly important to understand how ADSB works and where it comes from. Uh, I haven't found it to be a tremendous limitation in my flying because uh, typically, for example, at Sporties in Ohio, uh, we'll be getting ADSB weather about 200 feet off the ground. So. Uh, hopefully there's no bad weather between takeoff and 200 feet off the ground. Just to dive in a little bit of detail here on how exactly uh, ADSB works, um, I'll say at the outset here that um, you don't really need to know this for everyday operations. Um, you know, you don't need to get bogged down in this, but every once in a while if you suspect something's going odd or uh, doesn't look right in your in your ForeFlight app, it's worth understanding how this works. There are actually four types of ADS-B ground stations. This is sort of like VORs. If you remember, there are there are high VORs and low VORs. Same idea. There are surface, low altitude, medium altitude, and high altitude ADS-B stations out there, and they transmit slightly different weather products. The one place you'll probably see this is uh, you could be on the ground, say, in Florida, where there's a lot of ADSB stations, and you might actually get ADSB weather on the ground uh, if you're at an airport that has a ground station there. But you'll only see 150 nautical miles of radar. That's at 150 regional next rad. You won't see nationwide radar. That's not a bug. That's not a problem. It just means you're only receiving a surface station. Once you get up and get going, once you get a medium uh altitude or a, a high altitude, you'll get the entire continental United States radar. That's that CONUS next red you see there. So um, again, there's a couple other differences there in terms of how far out they transmit uh, METARs and TAFs or winds aloft. Um, again, typical use, you're going to be getting four, five, eight, even 10 or 12 stations uh, if you're in the eastern U.S. So you don't really have to worry about this, but it's worth knowing if you feel like you're missing some weather data. Uh, might, might consider what type of stations you're getting. And I'll show you just a little bit later where to find that information in ForeFlight. So if that's how the information is transmitted, what is it transmitting? What's the timing? Um, it's pretty similar to uh, XM or Sirius XM. Uh, Scott said Sirius XM might beat it by a minute or two in my experience, um, but it's pretty typical. Same idea that five minutes for most, uh, most weather products. The, the difference there on radar, though, is worth understanding. Again, ADSB breaks it down into two different packages. That continental U.S. radar, which is a lower resolution picture, that's transmitted every 15 minutes. The higher resolution, what I'd call maybe medium resolution, the same resolution as Sirius XM, is transmitted every two and a half minutes, but the actual picture itself is refreshed every five minutes. So for simplicity, we'll call that five minutes for regional and 15 minutes for um, CONUS radar. And then uh, five minutes airmets, SIGMETs, METARs, NOTAMs, and 10 minutes for uh, PIREPS, TAFs, winds aloft. One final comparison here that's uh, maybe helpful just for pointing out the differences of Stratus versus SX Air One or ADSB versus Sirius XM. Uh, you see, you can get basically the same weather products, all the essentials there radar, METARs, TAFs, TFRs. The ones worth pointing out are uh, the radar again is split into two with ADSB, and then there is no lightning on ADSB. So one of the features Scott was talking about there was uh, lightning and cloud to cloud and cloud to ground lightning that is not currently transmitted over ADSB. Um, and then again, the difference at the bottom is probably the one most people are familiar with: uh, it's subscription free with ADSB and thirty nine ninety nine for that Sirius XM pilot for four flight uh, subscription level. Scott mentioned briefly uh, and wanted to fill out a little bit more. This, this is evolving, so the products you get in ForeFlight uh, over SXAR1 will be growing. The products you get in ForeFlight over ADSB will also be growing. Uh, the timing's a little bit up in the air because you never know about these things as they slowly progress. Uh, my money would be on early 2018. Uh, Scott may know better than me on that, but this is eventually coming to ADSB. Uh, four products to be specific Lightning. Um, which is continental U.S., so won't have quite the coverage that Sirius XM has. Uh, cloud tops, and again, if you've seen this on the aviationweather.gov website, you'll recognize that chart. This is sort of a model-based cloud top, so this is not necessarily the uh, Sirius XM cloud tops 
picture you may have seen before. Um, it's, it's useful as a guide for where are the tops. I like it a lot in winter for trying to determine uh, when I might be on top of potential in-flight icing. But it is a product that has some limitations, specifically convective weather. It's really not designed to, uh, to report that as well. Also, uh, graphical turbulence and icing products will also be uh, sent over ADSB from 2,000 to 24,000 feet in different uh, layers there. So you can check. I find in particular the icing product is very, very good. It's become very accurate over the years. Um, and I think that'll be a very nice addition in addition to the lightning one. And again, we'll just have to wait and see um, how that comes about. You know, the, uh, Scott's been a part of a group that's been working on recommendations for this. It then has to be, uh, you know, implemented, tested, and made live. So stay tuned on that. But uh, one of the nice things I think on either platform here, ADSB or SiriusXM, is that you'll see additional weather products coming. I won't go into this too much, but uh, one of the things that always comes up talking about these two is radar. Scott showed this screenshot earlier of uh, ADSB versus XM radar. They are the same resolution on the regional scale. It's when you get to the national scale that you get the difference. So here's a good example uh, of Sirius XM in action. Uh, this was a flight from Denver back to Cincinnati, so a long flight, about a thousand miles. So here with uh, ADSB, you would have seen all that radar imagery, but it would have been lower resolution because it was a good 500 miles away from us. And then as we got closer to that weather, it would have come into higher resolution over ADSB. With Sirius XM, here we are right after takeoff and already had that in the higher resolution. So um, it, it's, it's, I think, just a good illustration of the difference that same resolution with Sirius XM and ADSB, but when you get to that national level, that's where you see the difference. That that higher resolution is available all over the U.S., not just within 150 to 250 miles like it is with ADSB. Really, my uh, one of the things I've discovered lately is the, the value of using both. Uh, certainly, you don't need to use both at the same time, but if you um, want to have the best of both worlds, as Scott said, it's a pretty nice setup. Stratus can connect to your iPad by Wi-Fi. Uh, and SX Air 1 can connect by Bluetooth. You can run both at the same time. And uh, what you get is typically uh, you're going to see GPS and traffic and attitude from Stratus. So you can see on the left side our synthetic vision display there with a backup attitude, attitude indicator and GPS driven instruments. And you'll see traffic on the moving map on that right side. Um, and you also get pressure altitude from Stratus. But then the weather overlay. Uh, is Sirius XM. And you can see that up in the top of the screen there by the timestamp. Uh, and it really gives you a great combination. You get all the products that uh, that you like. You get the higher resolution nationwide radar of Sirius XM. You get that on the ground. And the two really do work together uh, just fine. Uh, I didn't really know if that was going to work the first time we did it, but went and flew with it. And since then, I've flown about 25, 30 hours with that setup and, and found it to actually be a pretty great way to fly. All right, so with that background in mind on Sirius XM and with ADSB and how they work, uh, I want to share a couple of practical tips uh, for using these in the cockpit, and then we'll get to some scenarios. First, just as a review, if you haven't flown with either of these, uh, the setup, the getting started, it's really pretty simple. You turn on the box, uh, either the Stratus or the SX Air 1, go to your settings app on your iPad and connect by either Wi-Fi if it's Stratus or Bluetooth if it's GDL39 or SX Air 1. Uh, then open for flight and turn on whatever weather layers you want to see. So if it's radar, turn on radar. If it's METARs, turn on METARs. That's really it. And after you do that pairing the first time, whether it's Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, it should be automatic every time after that. So really it's a matter of turning on the box and firing up for flight, and that's all there is to it. So fortunately, not a whole lot to get tripped up on there. Location does matter. Matters a lot. So when we're looking at ADSB, you want it, to, it's essentially looking down to the ground for, to get those ground stations. So a uh, line of sight to the ground is important. That doesn't mean it has to be in a window necessarily. I've had the uh, Stratus work actually on the floor of the airplane plenty of times. So uh, it's not as sensitive. But if you can, a uh, window is a, is a good location for it. You're going to need a view of the sky for GPS. That's true for both SX Air 1 and Stratus. Uh, SX Air 1 also needs that view of the sky for the Sirius XM weather uh, transmission. If you have a Stratus and you have that AHARS, you need to keep it steady to have a reliable attitude. It doesn't necessarily have to be level. Uh, it can be, uh, 
you know, on its side, for example, and, and the app can recalibrate just fine, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't like it if it's sliding around the cockpit. So try to find, use a suction cup mount or maybe a dash mount and keep it stable. And then the only other thing is uh, direct sunlight. Both of these run fairly cool. Stratus has a fan in it. Um, so it's not a big deal, but if you can, I like to keep these out of direct sunlight on the dash baking. As you can see in that bottom screenshot, they work up there just fine. But uh, if you can get it on a suction cup on a side window, I think that gets it out of your way, gets that glare out of the windshield in front of you, uh, and typically lets it run a little cooler. So there's a different air, there's a different location in every airplane that works. Just experiment in your airplane, find what works best. Uh, I've flown with them in all kinds of different airplanes and helicopters and haven't found one yet where it won't work. Uh, they just usually take a little bit of experimentation. One of the most important things I think you can do if you're flying with data link weather, and, and this is actually true with any type of data link weather, uh, but ForeFlight makes it easy, is to check the status. You should have sort of a continuing scan, the way uh, an instrument pilot has a scan of the instruments to make sure that you know everything's going the way you want it to go. You want to have a scan of your weather products to make sure your receiver is working properly, make sure it's connected, make sure the battery still has some life in it, check the age of the weather products, check the GPS reception, check the traffic status. Um, you don't have to obsessively check this every 30 seconds, but you ought to have it as part of your flow that you're checking to make sure you're still getting current weather data. Um, no no uh, data link weather product is ever real time. The only thing real time is your eyes and uh, to a certain extent onboard radar if you have it. So it's not real time, but there's certainly a difference between a five minute old uh, radar update and a 25 minute old radar update that you didn't notice uh, had stopped updating. So make it a habit to check that status. In ForeFlight, it's really easy. From that maps page, tap the gear button at the top left corner there, as you see here on the screen, and then go down to the bottom and you can tap on any of the external devices that are connected. In this case, we tapped on Stratus. And you'll see the Stratus status menu. Again, it shows you how recently you received radar, text reports, all those kind of things. I also put this here to show that concept of different tower types. So if you are concerned that maybe I'm not getting nationwide radar and you wonder if you're getting a surface only station, you can tap on that receiving from and you'll see exactly how many towers you're getting and what type of tower they are and even the lat longs for where they're located. So that's all in that Stratus status menu. Make that part of your regular uh, regular scan in flight. With ADS-B, again, reception, a little more of a, uh, an issue out west. So uh, if you're flying out west, I don't think it's a bad idea to maybe turn on the ADS-B ground stations. Again, you can do this from the settings button at the top left of the maps page in ForeFlight. And you can, uh, you can see the little white tower symbols on the screen there. And it shows where they are and what your reception percentage is, the quality of reception you're getting there. I don't know that you need to <clears throat> excuse me, fly with this all the time. But if you think you're in an area of marginal coverage, for example, it might be helpful to know where is that station uh, that I'm getting the weather from and am I about to fly out of range with it? So just a feature to know that is there. And um, again, I use it mostly out west where the towers are a little bit further between. This is probably my favorite feature uh, in ForeFlight. Um, almost for anything, but certainly for weather, and it's the measure tool. Hopefully all you flying with ForeFlight uh, know this already, but if you tap on the map anywhere with two fingers at the same time, you'll get this ruler to pop up. And the ruler, can you can extend it, or contract it, you can twist around, move your fingers all around the map, and it will measure the distance between wherever your two fingers are. I use this a lot with weather to try to get a sense for how widespread the weather is, how how long is that line of rain? How far am I from my nearest VFR alternate? Uh, how long do I expect it's going to be before I get in that area with all the PI reps for turbulence? Uh, as you can see there, it uses your current GPS drive ground speed to give you not just the distance, but also the track, uh, the time en route, and even the fuel burn based on if you've put it in properly. So I think this is a great tool for getting some situational awareness, planning alternates, making a plan B around a weather. Um, I like it an awful lot, and it's really fast and easy to use. Probably the second most useful feature, I think, with weather is rubber band flight planning, a great tool. Tap and hold on your course line in ForeFlight, and then you can drag the course line uh, wherever you want it. When you release your finger, ForeFlight will suggest some things that are underneath that point, uh, VORs, intersections, airports, and you can change your flight plan. So I'll show you an example here later where we do this, uh, and I've started doing this a lot. 
uh, you know, in the in sort of the bad old days, you'd fly right up to that cell of weather and start looking at it and asking for 10 degrees right or 10 degrees left. One of the advantages of data link weather is you can make strategic decisions long before you get close to that that weather. So here's an example where you can just drag that course line till it's well clear of the uh, of those red returns up there and fly well around it. You know, if you're in a 172, there's no point in trying to punch through that. It's not going to it's not going to happen. It's not going to be a pleasant ride. So give it a wide berth and use the app to help you do that. And again, remember the delay. Like I said, there's no such thing as real-time data link radar. That doesn't mean it's not very very valuable, but remember the delay. Foreflight always displays a timestamp in the top left corner of the maps page, so you can always keep an eye on that. You'll see it turn different colors if it gets what the app thinks is old or out of date. One of the things uh, a lot of people may not know, though, is you can tap on that timestamp for all the details. So if you have multiple weather products turned on, here we're looking at radar, pyreps, and TFRs. Tap on that and you can get the details. In this case, all three were updated at the same time, but that's not always the case. Uh, you might be getting radar that's two minutes old, and you might be getting pyreps that are 10 minutes old. So if you ever want all the details, just tap on that timestamp up there, and you'll see all the particulars. My last tip, and this is obvious, uh, but I think Scott would echo it, is use your eyeballs. Uh, you know, the, I think Data Link Weather is a fantastic tool, and I really wouldn't fly without it anymore. But it's a tool, uh, and it gets a vote. But your eyes get another vote, and your gut gets a veto, as I like to say. So here's an example where we were flying up high on the flight levels in a citation. And you can see two towering uh, cells out there. The one on the right was barely registering at all. The one on the left <clears throat> was only showing up as light green. But does anybody really think we should fly through those? Uh, and here we are at 37,000 feet looking up at that one on the left. There's clearly some bumps in there regardless of what the radar says. So uh, use the tool, you know, use Stratus, use SX-01, use whatever data link you have, but use it only as an aid and a guide to inform your decision making. And when in doubt, avoid it visually, stay VFR and go around it, even if you're on an IFR flight plan. I think that's the smart way to go a lot of times. Okay, with that, we're gonna put some of that to use in a couple scenarios. So I have here five scenarios that um, I've run into over the past few years flying with uh, Stratus and more recently with the SXAR1. None of these are, are groundbreaking, uh, you know, uh, traps or anything like that, but I think they illustrate how you need to get some experience with these products and understand where they're valuable and where they may have weaknesses. So here's the first one. Um, we're flying back from uh, the West Coast in a Pilatus and headed back to Cincinnati. And we're watching this line of fairly colorful stuff develop to the south and east of us. Uh, and this is what's great with uh, data link weather, right? Because we can see that developing from 100 miles away. Uh, and it's very clear that we don't want any part of that. So we rerouted ourselves north of that to stay north. And we decided, well, we'll, we'll go around the worst of it to the north there and we'll keep an eye on it. So far, so good. As we got closer, you can see we went from that blocky national ADSB radar to that higher resolution regional radar. Uh, but it still looks pretty good around the north where we're headed there. It looks pretty darn ugly down south around uh, Missouri and, and western Kentucky there. But uh, so far, it looks like it's not too bad up north. We're going to keep the speed up, see if we can slip in before this line fills in. And here we are very close to our destination. You know, we're, uh, we're 13 minutes out. And look, there's barely anything out there uh, ahead of us, just a little bit of green. There's a huge hole. There's a huge hole, no problem, right? Well, obviously not. Wrong. And here's an example of that last statement about using your eyes. Yes, the radar was fairly clear ahead of us, just a little bit of green, looked like there was a wide hole, but this was the picture out the window with this sort of towering anvil-like thing out there that uh, we had no interest in flying through. So we ended up deviating much further around to the north, stayed, stayed VFR the entire time, stayed in clear air and, and, and deviated with our eyes, and had a nice smooth flight and uh, made an uneventful landing. But it's just an example of how you can let the radar picture talk you into doing something you're not comfortable with if you haven't thought it through ahead of time. And that radar picture was compelling, but the look out the window was even more compelling. And, and that's really what's the deciding factor. 
Here's uh, another scenario, second one, uh, flying with SXAR1. And this gets towards, I think, another important lesson, which is how do you decide if weather is quote unquote bad? Uh, you know, a lot of times on the you know evening news, they'll reduce it to, well, red is bad and yellow is usually bad and green is just light rain. And as I'm sure Scott could tell you 13 different ways, it's just never that simple. Uh, radar measures the reflectivity of precipitation in the air. That's it. It doesn't measure turbulence. It doesn't measure, uh, you know, lightning. It doesn't measure how rough your ride's going to be through there. Uh, it measures precipitation. So here's an example where there's a lot of yellow on the radar, uh, and it looks pretty ugly. But it turns out that it really wasn't. Uh, we had a uh, perfectly smooth ride through here. It was I IMC. We were in clouds, but we barely even had rain. Um, it was a perfectly smooth flight through. One of the tools you can use, I think, is, is ForeFlight because you have so many weather tools, as Scott alluded to, don't just get it fall into the trap of looking at the radar. Uh, in particular here, as Scott mentioned with, with the SXAR1, use the tool at your disposal here of both composite and the lowest uh, tilt or sometimes called base reflectivity. Compare them. They, they, they show different things, but I think if you look at both of those and you look at the lightning and you look at the tops and the storm cell movement, uh, you can get a much fuller picture of what you have ahead of you. I think even better than that is to know the air mass. Do a pre-flight weather briefing so that you know, am I flying into a rapidly moving cold front here with a dramatic wind shift and is this a squall line that's kicked up out front or is this just stratus clouds with rain? because moderate rain can be perfectly smooth and perfectly safe and show up as yellow. Or it could be the development of a squall line. It can be yellow and it could be convective and, and quite hazardous. So don't just look at the radar, use all those tools. Look at both uh, radar products, look at that lightning, look at the tops, the movement, all the other uh, features around it to give you a better sense of what's really going on. Here's a great chart that's in the four flight pilot's guide, you can find it in the documents tab in the app. And it's a reminder that the colors are not all the same between radar uh, delivery methods. So you have internet radar that comes in lots of different uh, variations, ADSB, and then Sirius XM. They all tell the basic same story. Purple is purple, red is red, and you don't want to fly through that. But you'll notice that the green and yellow is not all the same. Um, part of that's a, a factor of, for example, internet just has more uh, resolution. It's showing, you know, 20 to 25 dBZ and 25 to 30, whereas ADSB groups that all under one. So understand that yellow is not always yellow. Uh, it depends on kind of the weather source, and there just aren't any hard and fast rules about what you can, uh, what, what's safe to fly through and what's not safe to fly through. Scenario three, another tool at your disposal uh, we'll show here. A flight home here again, uh, this is summertime, we're flying with Stratus in this case, and pretty ugly looking line of storms out there, but fortunately they've moved off to the east, so our timing is perfect, we'll come in on the back side of this weather and land right on time, no problem, right? Well, you know by now that that's not the answer. Wrong. These storms were not moving in that traditional west to east as they typically do in the Midwest. These storms were sort of sagging south, uh, not moving too fast at all, but if anything, moving south. Um, and we did not get to our destination. We turned around and landed short at an alternate. Here's an example where animating the radar can give you a great, uh, great help. Hit that little play button in the bottom left corner of the app animate that radar and you'll get a much better sense of how the weather is really moving. Don't just assume it moves the same way it always does because uh, it clearly doesn't. Two more scenarios here and then we'll take your questions. Um, scenario four I think is this is a great example of how using all the information together really matters. Uh, this was a flight to AOPA to visit, uh, to visit those folks at Frederick Maryland Airport. And uh, there was definitely some weather out that day. We were IFR coming in there, and we originally were cleared all the way to the east of the airport to then swing around and fly an ILS. And if you've ever flown into Frederick for a fly-in or something like that, you know this is pretty typical. Uh, Potomac Approach wants to take you east of the airport to kind of get you in their airspace and then turn you around for the approach. And in this case, they wanted to take us southeast of the airport. Well, you can see from this picture that that's not going to happen. That's a bad idea. Um, so we said, unable, uh, we need to come up with another plan. 
No problem. ATC came up with a new plan and put us on effectively a right downwind for the ILS. We flew the ILS, worked out great. Uh, we really had nothing more than rain, didn't have a bump at all. As we landed, we can see some flashes of lightning off to the southeast. But this is an example where using all the information in context matters. It's great to look at radar, but if you put that radar on top of a moving map with your airplane and your route, and you put the approach plate on top of that, which is available in ForeFlight with the plates on maps tool, uh, you get all that information at a glance. It's an easy decision. Anybody would have made that decision given this screenshot. It's clear that you don't want to fly southeast to come back and shoot the approach. But it's about using all that information in context and stacking those layers up so you get a really great big picture view of the situation. So make sure you're using all of those and don't be afraid to tell ATC unable. You're the one sitting in the left seat. They're sitting on the ground in a very comfortable, dark, air-conditioned uh, radar room. So uh, if you don't like what you see, don't accept it. Then the last scenario um, is something I mentioned earlier, but I think it's just a great way to use um, data link weather en route is to make the strategic deviation. Make that deviation 100 miles in advance. Uh, as, I, as it says here, you know, don't fly up to the weather and then start trying to pick your way through and say, I need five degrees left and then 20 degrees right and, and wind and weave. I think a lot of the times it's easier just to plan your route to go well around that, uh, that weather. Certainly if you're VFR it is, and even if you're IFR, a lot of times this makes sense. So uh, I've started doing that. I've found ATC usually likes it a lot. Instead of asking for 30 degrees right for 50 miles, if you just uh, say, hey, I'd like to change my flight plan route, that way they can put in the computer, they can pass that down the line. Um, and typically, uh, they're quite happy to do that. And I think it's a great way to use um, strategic weather planning tools for strategic weather planning. So don't be afraid to use that rubber band flight planning tool and make that big deviation well in advance. With that, I wanted to leave just a little bit of time for your questions. So if you haven't had a chance to put your questions in yet, do that now. We'll get to a few of them. Um, and Scott, I'm going to start out with you, throw one your way. And this goes back to the gross filter. Um, and the question is, is the gross filter on the ADSB weather as well or only on Sirius XM? That's a great question, John. Um, I, I, what I would say is I've seen it a lot, lot more in the... Um, uh, the Sirius XM or XM world than I have in uh, ADSB. Um, I, I think in in general, any time a company has to produce a product, uh, including filtering, you're always going to have mistakes. Meaning some uh, some clutter will will uh, sneak through sometimes, and others, unfortunately, will cause you to um, to remove real precepts. So it does happen in both. I just seen it more in the XM world. Okay, great. Here's another one, Scott, that I think you can explain. I think you actually did a blog post on it very recently, but it's one we get a lot, which is why would I see METAR showing up as, you know, 55 minutes old when I'm getting, you know, five towers over Stratus and uh, it says it was updated five minutes ago. Why do I see a METAR that says it's 55 minutes old? Yeah, that was a blog that I just put out, uh, I think today, actually. Uh, and, it, you know, it's it's... You have to understand how the surface weather observing uh, you know, system works, um, and that is they only do one routine observation um, every single hour. So if you go to a, an airport like, um, let's say, BWI Baltimore, they're only going to do one routine observation, uh, usually at the right uh, a few minutes before the top of the hour. And then if the weather doesn't change operationally, significantly change over that next hour, you're only going to see that one. So it's very common to see uh, a, a METAR for BWI, for instance, when the weather's not changing a whole lot, to be 64 minutes old before it gets refreshed and it'll say five minutes or four minutes uh, age. And that's just because how uh, the ASOS, for instance, works in terms of its observing. Now, if there are weather that's changing, then they can issue special observations, uh, and those will come more frequently. Or if you're using an AWAS that usually updates uh, three times, they have root, uh, three routine observations. But it's it's pretty common, quite common actually, to see only one observation per hour. Yeah, and just a, a good reminder there that the 
difference between when the data is sent over ADSB and when the actual weather report are updated are, are not necessarily the same thing. So thanks for clearing that up. Um, another question that came up here is uh, about the difference between XM and Sirius XM. And I, I can take an initial swing at this. Uh, the question is about using current uh, panel XM antenna with Sirius XM. And there's probably no one size fits all answer here, but in general, it's important to understand that Sirius XM and the older XM systems that are in a lot of airplanes are different systems and really um, use different equipment and different receivers. So um, I'm not aware of a whole lot of interoperability there. Uh, if you've got, for example, an older a Garmin panel mount XM receiver, that's going to be different weather products and different stream and everything than you get with Sirius XM. Anything you want to add to that, Scott? No, I think you, if you try to mix and match things, that's just a, a disaster waiting to happen. You know, so I would never, uh, never, you know, tell folks to be able to do that. Um, one question here about um, West Coast flying um, and the question is, XM or Stratus better for West Coast mountain flying? Um, and I would say most likely XM there. It depends a little bit on altitude. You know, if you said you're in a King Air at uh, 24,000 feet, well, they'd really both work just fine. If you're in a piston airplane down low where line of sight really becomes an issue, that's where Sirius XM takes a lot of the hassle out of it because you're going to get it on the ground and at all altitudes, whereas uh, with ADSB, you're going to have to be probably a few thousand feet up in the air and thinking about mountains uh, before you get reception. So if you're really in uh, West Coast mountain flying, I would, I would probably take a look, look at that SXAR1. We've got uh, time for one more question here. Um, and the, it's about mounting. And, and Scott, you mentioned mounting the SXAR1. If you can, it likes to face south because it's it's pointing to the, the geostationary satellite that's that's in that direction. Question here is about stratus and you mounting it on a window. The question was, is, is one window better than another? For example, um, south facing versus uh, north facing. The answer is really no. There's no one way that's always better with uh, with a stratus. There are towers all over the U.S. So what you're what you're looking to see is a tower, and there's there, it, there's going to be towers almost always off the left and the right. So it doesn't matter. Either window is fine. The only time it might matter is again if you're in an area of really limited reception. Maybe you're out west and down low. Um, if you if you're thought you were on the edge of coverage and you knew that the one tower you were getting was out the right window, say, it would probably make sense to put on the right window to maximize that reception. But other than that scenario, there's really not a big advantage one way or the other. You're going to look up to the sky for GPS and down to the ground for ADSB stations. With that, we're going to uh, bid you good night here, try to stay on time. We thank you for joining us for this webinar. Again, recording will be available at sporties.com slash webinar. Thanks very much to Scott Denstadt for joining us. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and we hope to see you again on another Sporties webinar. Good night. Yeah, good night.